Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It's actually quite warm out here. Yeah, kind of like halfway regretting that we set up out I know. here at the moment. I, am, I think it's supposed to be 97 today. Next week we have like 101, 103, 106, 104, 103. Oh, it's going to be misery. So we'll probably have some videos for you guys where we're in the studio. We need to plan for that, for those yeah. hot days. Or it's just so early. Cool. we got to get up earlier somehow. I know. It's, it's so you know, hard with one kids. One of the kids. One of the kids is up almost every single night, and mm. I'm up with them. And, uh, or Russell is wanting in or out or whatever. There's usually something that happens in the night. So it's kind of hard to get going first thing in the morning. Oh, anyway... Enough of our personal woes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the moment. Um, you know, everything is really looking pretty good out there despite the heat. I mean, it hasn't been extreme yet, but um, I feel like we just, we've got the drip dialed in even on our annual areas mm -hmm. and we've just been pretty diligent about going through. We, we drive through every single night with the kids. We get on the gator and just drive around and then we can kind of make notes of things that we need to add like a dripper here or, you know, minus one there, whatever. Um, so I feel like we've done better this year than any other year of fixing that. So in the evenings, once we're kind of done with our day, our work day and our watering and all of our chores, it's kind of the first time where I don't feel like frantic, like I need to get back outside and check on things, mm -hmm. which is really quite nice. So let's jump into the videos from last week, which I think we have fewer of. We did skip two days. Uh, we did not post on Saturday or Monday of the 4th of July weekend. So that affects how many we're going to answer today. First video was flower bed maintenance, perennial cutback, rose dead heading, and fixing drip. Um, that was just a day that I needed to get some things done. I had some salvia, some red valerian that I needed to cut back, alliums I needed to remove, uh, poppies needed cutting back, roses needed dead heading, and then I added drip to nine pots. Check those nine off the list yeah. and not having to uh, water those every day, which was really great. It was a good work day. Uh, Julie said, when you have trouble sleeping at night and live on the west side of Oregon, you can always find Laura at 4 a.m. already working and sharing her projects with us. Good morning, Laura. Thank you for being here. That's awesome. We do schedule our videos to come out like at 5 a.m. our time, which is not yeah. standard time, which means, yeah, if you're on the western side of the state, then, yep, 4 a.m. I think we ended up doing 5 a.m. because that made it um, 7 for on the people East on Coast. the East Coast, right? The yeah. two hours difference? Yeah, so that way they could like wake up and, you know, watch it first thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems to work. This yeah. is kind of a time we picked and yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andrea said, do you use commercial grade drip tubing or whatever we would buy at the garden shop? Mm, whatever you would buy at the garden shop, is right? Well, I don't think there's a difference um, because like we use the same stuff that Benny uses. Yeah, I mean... We, I mean, that's commercial, right? The only difference, we use everything that you can buy in like the drip irrigation section at Home Depot, say. Yeah. Well, Except we also go to the place in Fruitland. Um, what's Pipe, that place called? Pipeco. Pipe that has like Rainbird supply. but sodas. Yeah, they do a lot of Rainbird stuff. But they also sell, I think they sell the Centennial, that one with the blue line. I don't know. I don't think that probably anybody else gets Centennial drip tubing. You just have to find the one that's like thick enough to where it doesn't kink. Uh -huh. But not too thick to where you can't get the emitters in. It's all stuff you can get at your. You kind of almost just or... need to like buy a little bit of it, uh -huh. like buy small amounts, test it out, see what you think. Like it's not a one and done thing because you're gonna have to replace it after a number of years anyway. I don't know how many garden centers actually carry drip supplies. I know that I've talked to my parents about it before, and they're the real estate for them, like the amount of floor space they have to carry certain items, mm -hmm. is pretty limited. So they're they're really careful about what they bring in and what they don't bring in. Um, and drip is such a vast. I do think though that they could bring in a line of stuff. Uh, they'd have to figure out, you know, where Whoa. to bring it in from. Right. But it would be a good addition. It would be because it, make, it makes sense. But, you know, floor space is a, it just, I don't know how much money you make on drip supplies versus other stuff. Right. And then it's also like how far into it do you get? Because mm -hmm. we live in a very agricultural area. So like drip stuff can, can drift into like uh like big fields you know like yeah. some people are coming and they're literally getting like thousands and thousands of rolls of drip tape not rolls but thousands of feet uh-huh well rolls a, yeah mm -hmm. a lot of some guys rolls. some guys use so much drip tape in their field it's crazy yeah we drive by and we're like dang i wonder what kind of machine they've got to have a machine with like that, rollers that, that pulls out all those lines of drip tape because it would take and yeah. like making sure that all the drip emitters are facing up and all of that right. business. Oh, I can't even imagine. It is a good way to, to water stuff though around here. It's very efficient for sure. 
Cheers Bloom said, I got inspired and did pruning, deadheading, fertilizing, watering. Thank you, uh, Laura. Do you plan to someday have a pool for the kids? Will be a fun spot in your yard and planting around the pool. We've talked about it. Um, my parents have a pool. They live 10 minutes away. They take immaculate care of their pool too. Yeah. It's always beautiful. It's always heated to 82 which, or like 84, 82 to 84. I am a fair weather swimmer. Like I don't want to get in water that's your below 82. And, your mom and dad <laughs> fight about the temperature. Your yeah. mom always wants a little, little hotter. Yeah. And your dad's the one that sees the bill. Yeah. And he's like, ah. Uh, yeah, Plus just, I think he'd rather it a little cooler anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they do such a good job with their pool. I'm kind of like, let's just... It'd be such okay. a huge expense to put in a pool yeah. that it's hard to justify when you have access to one. Well, and I don't want to get ourselves. I already feel like, I mean, we have to, we have, to have help with what we're doing right now. There's mm -hmm. no way I could do it without Paul and Bethany. Mm -hmm. And then you take care of the grass. Like, there's no way that a team, we could do it without a team. Um, so I just, like, the more things you add, you add a pond, you add a swimming pool, you add whatever else yeah. it might be then you think, I don't want to stretch myself so thin that we can't go, you know, and hang out with yeah. family because we're tied to this this garden and this place. And then you, we also think on like super reality, like what if we stopped making videos for whatever reason? Yeah. Like what if one of us got hurt? Yeah. What if one of our family members got sick and we didn't, we wanted to, you know, scale back what we're doing so we could help, you know, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. We think about all of those possibilities and then think about, the addition of new things. We try to really strike a good balance and... Most of the time, the things that we invest in are beneficial to our YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. You know, like adding more land, more plants. Mm -hmm. um, Cause those are all things that, that benefit the channel and, yeah. and our own enjoyment too. I mean, yeah. you know, that's great. And the but, kids have plenty of opportunity. This last weekend I took, we were in the pool three days in a row. Mm -hmm. Like we go out there often and I was actually thinking I've got all the pool stuff in the dryer right now. And I thought maybe we get the recap video done. I've got one other project I want to do actually out at their house. It'd be perfect. We can go out and then I can take the kids swimming. Yeah. The swimming. Uh, Samantha loves it. The whole time she goes, wee, yeah. wee, just over and over again. It's so cute. Loves the water. Uh, okay, so John McFeeder says, how can you stand wearing black in hot weather? I don't know how you bear it. I mean, hot is hot is hot. I don't know. When you get to a certain temperature out here, it's just hot no matter what I'm wearing. Um, I feel comfortable in black because one, I'm used to wearing it. I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. Two, I get so dirty. So dirty. I don't know how people don't wear black out in the garden. Like, Painters I'm, wear white. Huh? Painters wear white. Yes, they do, but they're in, well, I guess they're outside yeah. too. Um, my mom can wear light colors and she's like clean as a whistle when she gets done gardening. Yeah. I'm, I just have like pig pen, pig pen. I don't know. Does it burn? Like, um, cause sometimes when I, I mean, here I'm wearing black, but like when I go out in a black shirt, mm -hmm. sometimes it just soaks up the sun and it just feels like it's like bur kind of burning my skin. No, underneath. I feel worse if I'm uncovered. Huh. I think it's kind of like um, the people. No, I mean who... uh, black versus white. Oh. Or mm -hmm. lighter colors. Nope. You don't notice the difference. I don't notice the difference oh. at all. It's, I think it's just like it's kind of like my hair. I'm used to having it down. It actually protects a lot of my skin. I was thinking about it yesterday. How, um, I don't know. You'll probably have seen the video by the time this one comes out. But we were at our friend's house planting, and it was hot, 96. I had a black shirt on. My hair was down, and it was kind of like in my face a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I was thankful for it because I don't like to wear hats. They annoy me. Um, but when my hair is covering my face, it is some amount of protection. I do wear um, SPF, sunscreen. yeah, 50. Um, anyway, wait, so I do wear sunscreen and I do reapply throughout the day. So it gets reapplied like two or three times during the day because I do sweat it off. Um, but uh, yeah, you just get used to it, I think. Mm. And I, I find that exposing more skin actually makes me hotter. Mm. Sure. Because I'm just used to it. Well, it's kind of like people who work in the fields. Yeah. They're fully covered. Like, right. like everything, like those cloths over their hats that kind of right. go over their face. And you would think like, oh, it must be a sauna. But they're just accustomed to it. Trixie said, would you please explain to the Southern woman how your frost-free faucets work? I've never seen any, anything like it. Even though I'm at 8B Texas and we do get below freezing periodically. Thank you and bless you. So frost-free uh, faucets are those that the water line has been uh, run way deeper in the soil below the frost line. Um, so if you get pretty cold in the winter time, you know that frost line in the soil, it'll go deeper and deeper and deeper depending on how cold you are. So we have frost-free run at 48 inches, I think. 
right? Yeah, four feet. Four feet down. Um, that way the water won't freeze in the line so you won't have any breakage. And then we have those um, hydrants outside where um, it, how it works is the water doesn't actually sit in the, the pipe, right? Like it goes back down. Yeah, the lever is at the is at the four foot level. Is at the so bottom. when you when you pull it up, it's actually letting water up from from four feet down. That makes sense. I didn't really actually know that. Oh really? <laughs> Until right now. Yeah. I mean, it, you've mentioned to me. Well, the water is not actually in the faucet, but I it's just a, didn't really think about it's it. It's a rod that goes down. So when gotcha. you pull it open, the rod I think maybe pushes down or something like that, mm -hmm. um, and then lets the the water out. I'd be interested to know though. Um, if in colder zones, if they just can't have any lines like that buried, mm -hmm. or if they have to go even deeper, or maybe four feet is kind of universal in the, in the U.S., mm -hmm. where it's like pretty much even in Minnesota, you could go four feet down. Oh, I don't know. That seems pretty deep. I mean. Yeah, but does the frost go down that far in, in you know, like a zone three or something oh, like geez. that? I don't know. I don't know. That'd be, that'd be interesting. But I, I'm guessing in like a zone eight, you probably can just put them a foot or two mm -hmm. below the soil. And even though it, it freezes occasionally, the ground never really freezes. And regular faucets like that are run off of your irrigation system, uh, those get blown out with our irrigation system. So we can't access water from those. It's just from the frost freeze. Paula said, when you said Paul came behind you, I was curious if you have a coordinating meeting daily, weekly, a to-do list for Paul, what's your system? We don't have a system. We text a lot. And we really, you know, Paul's been here for three seasons now. He's pretty in tune with what we're doing and what, it, like you were saying earlier, gardening is pretty repetitive. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you plant, you run drip, you mulch. You plant, you run drip, you mulch, you know. Um, occasionally, and weed. And weed, yeah. yeah. Uh, harvest. Yeah. yeah, there's those things. Um, you know, if Paul's working on something on the other side of the house and we're doing a project, occasionally I'll snap a picture like, hey, I just planted these geraniums or this or that. Um, and then that way he knows and I know whoever has a chance for us to go run drip to him. We do that. Also, that indicates like these are going to need hand watering until somebody has a chance to do that. Um, so we keep communication up via text all day, you know, a yeah. lot of the day. So it works pretty well, but we never have any meetings. We don't have any need for that. We have an amazing team of people. Um, MV Catherine said, why don't you wear a holster for your Felco pruners? I have a holster. I've never been a holster person. It's probably because I like long things. I like to wear long things because I don't like any skin to show ever when I bend over. Um, so it kind of gets in the way. Like even wearing a microphone in my back pocket is the worst <laughs> because my tank top, like I want to pull it a little bit down over my back pocket mm -hmm. and I don't want that thing like the mic pack thing kind of just hangs everything up but yeah i've never been a fan of that at all just haven't do they sell some type of like a leg holster you know oh, i would like never wear that for... <laughs> knee pads leg holster i would never wear any of that i don't want to be encumbered by hats yeah or encumbered unencumbered encumbered you want to be unencumbered yes i want to be unencumbered Chris says, Laura, have you ever thought of reusing the allium heads? I'd spray paint some for fall, yellow, orange, burgundy, black, and winter colors of gold, silver, red, royal blue. I know you do quite a few dried flower arrangements in the cooler seasons, and these would make a wonderful color pop. You know, I've thought about it. I'd mentioned maybe coloring, uh, painting mine purple and then having my mom come over. Some, uh, some one of you guys posted a picture of that somewhere. I saw a picture of the purple alliums. It has been sprayed, and you know... It's, that seems like an awful lot of work. <laughs> also, you know, there are some projects that I, you can gauge what the comment section will be like, and maybe this is the negative thing to bring up yeah. about it, but sometimes like using spray paint outside on flowers, that could possibly bring in, it does, yeah, you know, I it can a lot imagine of what the comment section would be and sometimes it's not worth it. Yeah even though I don't think there's nothing wrong with it. There is no bee in its right mind that's gonna go visit that flower. There's so many things blooming right now. I don't find anything wrong with it personally, um, but sometimes it's just not worth it. <laughs> uh, next video was raised beds, tour, harvest, clear out, and planting new crops. So I just gave you a tour of how our raised beds are doing. We have 12 of them um, and just showed you like the good and the bad. There is a one garlic bed that I forgot to turn the water, the individual water faucet onto this spring. I had already harvested that. Um, the other garlic needed to be harvested. It was pretty dried down. And then we harvested some other things, some potatoes and you know, whatnot. And then I went in and replanted the beds that I had cleared out. So it's kind of the midsummer revamp of the raised beds. Callie said, this morning before my coffee and Laura, I ran, out, uh, I ran out seeds in hand and planted mini pumpkins on a new arbor. It was beginning to rain and I wanted to get them in before the rain. I checked and it isn't too late, but getting close. Now I'm enjoying my coffee. Good morning, everyone. 
I love hearing those kinds of things, what everybody's planting and what they're up to in their garden space. That's really fun. Heather said, I've heard you mention kohlrabi a number of times, but I've never heard of it before. What exactly is it and how does one use it? Uh, kohlrabi is a vegetable crop, a cold crop that forms kind of this big kind of starchy bulb at the bottom of the plant. It's a weird looking vegetable. It looks like that bulb should be underneath the soil. Mm -hmm but you can peel it and cut it. It's kind of like a sweet cabbage flavor. A lot of people eat it raw. Maddie Maddie says, how long does your lavender last throughout the season? Mine dried up already. Usually we get two bloom crops out of it. So the first flush right now is still going for it. We'll go in and cut the bloom stalks off. So we shear it back to the leaf canopy and then it usually flushes back and blooms again in the season. Give it a go, Garden said, but did you check for wildlife before harvesting the cabbage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought about that as I was pulling the cabbage up. But I'll tell you what, I won't ever be including that in a video <laughs> again. For those of you who know what happened, you know. Susan said, did you make calendula salve or lip balm? I made calendula salve, I think it's been a couple of seasons ago now. I still have it, we're still using it. I don't use it all the time. I use it more as like a, like a remedy, not like a daily use. It's like if the kids have a dry patch of skin or something, I'll use it on um, them and it works really well. But I uh, plant calendula for a couple of reasons. One, it's an aphid host crop. Um, so if you have aphid issues in your vegetable garden or anywhere in your garden, plant calendula or Brussels sprouts, really. And you won't have any aphid problems on any other plant because they love calendula. Um, so it's kind of like a sacrifice crop almost. Uh, also, I like to use them as cut flowers. If I can find some clean ones, I like to use them as cut flowers. Connie said, have you ever thought about butterfly houses and bees on your property? I did buy a butterfly house last year to put in Benjamin's butterfly garden and I still have it in the barn. I think I need to put it out. Um, bees is something we've thought about maybe reintroducing, but it's something that I'm not super interested in taking care of myself because I've tried it a couple of times and the bees always leave. Um, so if I could get somebody that could come in and take care of them, mm -hmm. like bring your boxes here mm -hmm. if you want, or like I'll rent some bee boxes. I don't know how that works. Well, you know, we could maybe do something over near the orchard. Yeah. Especially maybe like on the, as you're looking at the orchard to the right side of it, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of space over there. Yeah. You can even tuck it into the back corner mm -hmm. of the orchard. Something that would look really cute back in there. Yeah. Be a good spot for him. Patricia said, what time do you usually start in the garden? While it's cooler, do you then stop at the main heat of the day? I think we already covered that a little bit. Um, we don't start in the early morning, but we would like to. We need to start making some tracks to shift our day. Yeah. I really like, I need to force myself to go to bed earlier. Like, what I you need to, to do so is you late. need to almost like write down all the things uh, that prevent you from going to bed earlier mm -hmm. and just tackle, like fix each one of those things, whatever they happen to be. Well, it's not really a thing to me. It's like, I'm not tired. I'm so used to, well, some days I'm tired, but I'm so used to um, just staying up that, to go to bed. Then I get up at a weird time because mm. I'm just like done sleeping at this point. I mean, thankfully I don't seem to require a ton of sleep to, in order to function, um, but it would be nice to shift that sleep no matter you know, how much I get, and yep. then be able to get up early in the morning. Yeah. Work on that. Something to work on. <laughs> Add it to the list. Next video is planting birch trees and three varieties of ground cover. So we started out that project thinking, okay, we're going to plant these two birch trees. We had a Royal Frost and a European White. They're both gorgeous. Uh, we planted them on opposite corners of the South Garden. And then we were going to tackle some uh, of the pathway, which <laughs> we've only done that first little section. That's yeah. all we've had a chance to do. And with the temperatures coming, I'm kind of like, this project's probably going to sit here until this fall. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. We'll see what happens. But uh, we forgot about a meeting that Aaron had. So uh, we ended up not being able to work on the pathway because we have to do it together. It takes two of us to lift those huge rocks. Um, and then I planted some ground covers instead. I had some skull cap, which is looking great. I was so excited to show you that one. I'd never really heard of it before. So fun new plant for me. And then a couple new varieties of ajuga. And one of them, so underneath the Euonymus, I planted the bronze, I think it's bronze beauty ajuga. I was walking by it the other day. I haven't run drip to it yet. I was walking by it and one of the four inch cans is still sitting there. Really? I missed it. I just didn't plant it. Whoa. It's still alive. That's lucky. I know. So I'm about to get the auger out and plant that one. Lila Isla Bloom says, oh man, if I had to do that pathway, I'd set up one of those pop-up 10 by 10 canopies for shade while I worked. I'm sweating just looking at it. That is a great idea. Do We don't have a pop-up anymore, I do we? I don't think we do. We used to have one, but... Uh, what did we use it for? 
Well, I used to set it up and then, because we, all of our projects in the beginning, you were behind a table, seem, seemingly. Oh, um, yeah. And so, like, I would set one up over you and I would set one up over myself as well. We had two. I don't even remember that. A long time ago. Where? Where did we set them up? I think at? they may have broke in the, in the wind. Hmm. I maybe have vague memories of that. Seems like a long time ago. Nancy says you didn't happen to mention the arb you also planted in this video after you and Aaron planted the trees. I assume you were replacing one. Where? Uh, yeah, I completely forgot to talk about that in the end. We figured, well, we've got all the stuff out. We may as well replace the one arb. So it was the arb that we replaced earlier this season, the one where the water was cooling. It was the second cooling. replacement. Yeah. Um, so Aaron plugged the main line. We let the water drain. He drilled some really deep holes. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how deep you went. Maybe just to like punch um, through whatever. Yeah, maybe down like three feet or so, maybe four. It's pretty deep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the water seems to drain better. And then instead of having as many emitters as we have on the other arbs, we just put one half gallon per hour emitter on this one. So far, so it's, far it's yeah. looking good. Yeah. So it's just a weird spot because all the other arbs in that whole line, these are the ones out in the south garden on the west side fence line. Um, all of them are doing great, growing beautifully with the amount of attention and water we're giving them. And just that one was yeah. like in this little weird bowl right. of hard pan. Yeah. So anyway, hopefully we fixed the problem. We happened to have one extra arb sitting there. So we just decided to do it and I forgot to mention it. Chelsea said, you've planted so many beautiful trees. Do you ever wonder if you're planting so many that someday you won't be able to grow some of the sun loving things? Oh, I know I won't be able to. <laughs> this whole garden I have to treat as a full sun space right now because even with trees out there, they're baby trees, it's gonna take years. Um, and then I'm excited for it, the yeah. shift, the shift from sun to shade stuff. Um, in the end, I want it to be a nice, comfortable, shady, cool place to walk. Mm -hmm. And if that means swapping out all of our perennials for shade stuff, excellent. Well, and the other thing to keep in mind too is that in our area, it's so sunny that we can get away with putting some hydrangeas like in between a couple trees mm -hmm. to where they get like a block of, you know, four or five hours of sun. Mm -hmm. And they still seem to do pretty well for us because it's like so much sun. It's so bright. Like our sun is intense and we, we almost never have cloud cover. Whereas I think other places, you know, they have that, they say that hydrangeas need like six hours of sun. Mm -hmm. But I almost wonder if in our area, they don't quite need a full six hours. Like they can get away with maybe four, mm -hmm. just because of the fact that like, it's never overcast. Whereas in those areas where they say they need six hours of sun, that's an area that is gonna be getting a little bit of overcast. So maybe. it's not truly getting that six hours all the time. Sure, that makes sense. I think we'll always have pockets that will be sunnier out there and it depends on what side of the tree things are on too because the tree will shade one direction you know like it'll shade to the east no toward the west in the morning and then toward the east in the afternoon so it kind of just depends on where you're planting your things and how much sun and how intense that sun is during that part of the day uh, but it will be such a gradual process because i think we're going to be dealing with tons of different growth rates out there it'll be interesting to see how it, it actually evolves i was just talking to our neighbor he came over um the neighbors that have all of the trees that are so beautiful over there um and i told him like part of me wants to be able to fast forward five ten years like just to see what those trees yeah. will look like and what this whole space will look like um i don't want to fast forward time but i do want to see what the trees will look like rachel said ground covers are new to me as far as my own garden do i still have to mulch down the road when my ground covers have matured not as much because there's nothing to mulch i mean if you plant ground covers they're going to be just all over the ground and they're going to be serving pretty much the same purpose as mulch will would serve in your garden you know weed suppression water retention um, all of those things they keep the roots of your plants cooler so, I mean, the more ground covers, the less mulch, the less weeds. I mean, it's all, all in all, a good situation. T Wild said, Laura, could you speak to how you stake a tree? With, why with the stake next to the trunks instead of with two stakes at a distance from the trunk with a rope cord to stabilizing? Uh, oh, those, those trees were staked by the grower, right by the trunk. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just because birch trees are so darn flexible when they're growing. And so to create a really strong leader, especially in wind, windier areas, you can lash them to something to keep them straight. We don't typically, I did on our blue spruce recently. Mm -hmm. We have a weeping blue spruce. So it's just kind of situational. Uh, it's a, called the blues. And if you don't stake the leader up, like straight, it will uh, take on this really weeping habit and be a little bit more of like a shorter specimen and you won't see the weep 
quite as distinctly? I think to answer the question, in, if you're trying to stake the trunk, like the lower section, you would want like one or two stakes, you know, about a foot or two away. Uh -huh. And then you would tie that. But if you're just wanting to keep the, like you said, the leader, uh -huh. then you do a stake right next to it. Like mm -hmm. a, what are those like bamboo stakes yeah, or something like that? that's typically what we use. Mm -hmm. So it's like depending on what you're going for. If mm -hmm. you're trying to keep the trunk straight or if you're trying to keep the leader straight. Right. And sometimes we just use like a guy wire. Yeah. We use a tree strap yeah. around the branch so they're nice and soft and they don't damage the trunk or the branch. And then you use a string down into the ground where you've staked it down, you know, like a tent stake. A little Those bit. seem to work really well um, for us in windy areas where mm -hmm. it's like you know that it's just, it just has a propensity to lean one way. Right. Just because of the wind. So you just put the guy wire just to stop it so it can't go too far one direction. And we don't leave them on what, but six months maximum? Yeah. We take them off and kind of reassess the situation. Right. And that's the most important thing. If you're going to stake something, which typically we don't like to stake it unless we see an issue, um, because I think it creates more of a weak tree. Uh, so if you are staking it for a correctional issue or something like that, um, you just want to make sure that you are minding the whatever is around the trunk, the straps, the string, all of that stuff, because trees will start to grow over that sort of thing, and then it can be really unhealthy for the tree. Uh, Gail said, I'm so happy you can have this great job. After you do a video, do you go lay down on the couch and watch TV? Maybe eat bonbons and think about what video to do tomorrow. Ah, I wish it was that way. Yeah. It's a lot of work, you guys. Uh, there's a lot of prep. There's a lot of cleanup. There's a lot of planning uh, and just a lot of chores. Like there's a lot to do around here. So um, like today, after we get done with this recap video, I'm going to go out and water the greenhouse um, and water some things. We check on things. Then we usually go do another video project. And then I have to go back out and check the greenhouse again. I do my rounds for the day to check on newly planted perennials, newly planted shrubs, make sure they don't need any additional water. We check the orchard, I check the flower garden, um, usually with the kids, I've got the kids with me um, to do those checks. And uh, then it's dinner time and I've got to like make sure I laid out whatever to thaw earlier in the day and then we prep and have dinner and then we clean up and then um, we play with the kids most evenings. We we'll go night, for a drive. We or... do go for drives quite often or we drive in the gator um, and or play, you or I are on the floor with the kids yeah. in their toy area and playing with the kids. So full days for sure, yeah. LR said, is the recession affecting you guys up there? My fruit just falls off the trees. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> well, my peaches, um, speaking of fruit on trees, my peaches got frozen, the blooms got frozen. So I only have like three peaches on both trees. Um, apple, one of our apple trees, I don't know if it didn't, I don't know what happened there. Like, I don't think there's any fruit on it. The other apple tree has got a ton of fruit on it. Um, apricots were a loss because um, they were brand new planted this spring and they got frozen too. There's quite a few red Bartlett pears. Uh, the plum has a few nectarines loaded. So our fruit, our orchard is just kind of off this year. I have not been diligent about spraying, which I think is a huge part of it. Um, I did our winter, our dormant spraying, which is great, but then you do need to, especially like with uh, plums and peaches and stuff in our area, they deal with leaf curl, um, and you do need to continue on with a spray regimen, which I have not done. So anyway, there's just a lot going on. Again, kind of coming back to the like, make sure you have a process in place and mm -hmm. you have it nailed down before you start adding more stuff to it. And I think that's why a lot of our projects are just sitting um, because we started too many of them like the back garden where we ripped the fence out where it still has the boxwoods. I wasn't ready to do that project. Um, anyway, but we had to trench through, so we had mm. to break the sprinklers. It was one of those things that kind of needed to happen, but I'm not ready to tackle it. Such is life. We'll just do things as we can. Um, is a recession affecting you guys? I mean. Uh, okay, so in the gardening world, like we're not really part of the gardening, we're part of like the YouTube world. No, it's really not affecting us. Um, and I typically, it doesn't feel like it affects gardeners or like your parents are in, you know, retail. Mm -hmm. um, and it has never really affected them either because people, people garden no matter what. They just, it's the types of gardening that changes. So during a recession, people grow more food. During non-recessions, people grow other stuff and they buy fountains mm -hmm. and they buy, you know, they're putting in pools and like, you know what I mean? So it's like people are spending money on gardening. It just it just depends on what they're doing. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, total. I do know that people have spent a ton of money on fireworks this year. Yeah. Oh there, my goodness. There did not appear to be a recession on the 4th of July. No, and when you have a sleeping baby in the house, I'm like outside trying to enjoy the fireworks, but like still Samantha's asleep. She slept through the whole thing. And we can see the city fireworks from our house. So, you know, we can line our chairs up and enjoy this beautiful fireworks show. But it was like there was a rival competition. There was somebody mm. else in town that their finale was way bigger than our like actual town's fireworks finale. But it seemed like every residence around us, I felt like we were in a, the fishbowl of the firework yeah. scene. Like we didn't know where to look. There were so many fireworks going off. So much money being burned. Oh my gosh, I could not even believe it. I mean, we had a few. You bought like a handful yeah. this year, far fewer than normal, um, enough for the kids to enjoy, but we don't didn't need to. I mean, there's yeah. so many people f just, oh my goodness. I felt, so, I always, I'm always torn about that because like I have such fond memories of the 4th of July and fireworks and being so excited about it. But then also I feel for the animals. Yeah. I feel for people with babies. I feel for people with PTSD and I like, like struggling with that. Yeah. I struggle with it like every year, ever since we had babies, really more than anything. Oh, it makes me think of all those things, but they, they were pretty. Tim says, how in the world do you and Aaron afford to do all you do? Not just the expense, but the amount and intensity of work. You have such an incredible eye for design and knowledge of plant species. It's absolutely amazing. I've been watching for some time now, but so many times I feel overwhelmed, just saying. I feel overwhelmed too sometimes. <laughs> You're not alone. Uh, it's been a crazy YouTube journey for us, for sure. I mean, when we started doing what we do now, we'd never dreamed we would be doing it the way we are now. Um, it's just been, yeah. I think, you know, we just made a decision kind of early on as things started to progress that we were going to try to put, you know, money back into what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's pretty evident that you know, we've been doing that mm -hmm. now with employees and mm -hmm. the amount of projects we're doing. Like, it's pretty evident that the the revenue that we generate from mm -hmm. making videos kind of goes back into to making more videos mm -hmm. and we enjoy doing it. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah. We, we've talked about maybe not <laughs> doing as much and maybe like, we probably should go on a vacation at some point. Yeah, we're talking about going on one this winter with the kids, some more warm. Um, and now that the kids, well, at least Benjamin is old enough to remember uh, at this point. So, I mean, when the kids are super young, it's kind of like you're just taking care of your kids in a different location yeah, where, right. where you don't have all of the comforts of home. So it didn't really feel worth it. But now it feels like Benjamin would just, he would love it yeah. to go somewhere. So um now is the time to start doing that yeah we have talked about like going down to three videos a week or whatever but i just can't see that happening yeah we're just too like you and i are just like we we just like to push mm -hmm. i don't know it's at some point at some point we're gonna have to back off even just a little bit mm -hmm. um and i think it just it'd be healthy for us to take especially like in January, like yeah. we should go somewhere warm in January because yeah. there's not a lot going on here and it's the best time to take a break, you mm -hmm. know, like a one or two week break from making videos. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, even like financially, we make the least amount of money in January mm -hmm. um, Makes just sense. because it's a gardening right. channel, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. you know, um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. How I Dead Head Roses was the next video and I just wanted to sit down and take a minute to explain a, a little bit more in detail how I deadhead our roses and how I care for them in the middle of summer because it was a part of our maintenance video earlier on like a couple videos prior but we didn't really get any good close-up shots because I was just trying to get work done you know and it's really hard to uh, get details on everything when you're just kind of piling on the work for one uh, project so I just talked about my method um, we got some hopefully some good close-up shots for you guys to see how I do it and then I just went out and tackled it and I did it in little portions like I, I went out an hour or two over the 4th of July weekend actually when Samantha was napping I just got my bag and my clippers it was really peaceful um, so that's why I was wearing a couple different shirts 
during that video because I didn't do it all in one day. And Deadheading Roses is not all in a one day project for me. I mean, it's all the season long, right? Most of my roses, I actually don't have any hybrid tea roses. Some Grandifloras present with one uh, bloom per stem. So I was able to kind of show what a hybrid tea would look like if you had one out in your garden. Uh, but most of mine are the cluster type. So you've got roses just coming on all the time and they're always in some state of needing to be deadheaded. So it's just a constant project. Terry said, thank you, I learned something new today. I knew about cutting at the five leaves, but didn't know about watching for which direction it was facing. Great tip. Just in time, deadheading my roses is on my to-do list for this week. Love watching your videos. Uh, you're a great speaker and speak clear and at a nice speed that I can listen to um, without having to keep replaying it. Thanks again. That's a really sweet comment. Most of the time I get like, you're talking way too fast, slow down. And I did see quite a number of comments about the outward facing bud. I think that's something that, um, I don't know. It's an autopilot for me and it will become like, especially if you're a beginner and you're just getting started deadheading roses, the more you do it, it becomes autopilot for mm -hmm. you too. And you just go in and you know exactly what to look for. And um, when you know like the, the actual growth pattern of a rose and how they are more vase shaped, um, it makes sense mm -hmm. to find those outward facing buds. Mary said, thank you, Laura. This video is great. I have some questions. What can I do if my flower edges burn right away? We're only in the high 80s. Also many have Swiss cheese looking leaves. What should I do for them? Uh, first off, I would check the water. Make sure you're giving the roses enough water. If they're burning at 80 degrees, it's a water issue or it could be a score. If you have a ton of wind, um, maybe there's not enough water in the leaf to support that amount of wind. You know, you could be dealing with some scorch issues. Uh, it could be herbicide possibility. I, those are all the things that I would check for. Uh, Swiss cheese looking leaves. Now that's kind of weird. Um, if the holes are on the outer part of the leaves, leaf cutter bees love roses. And so they take like, like moon shaped cuts mm -hmm. out of the edges of your leaves. They don't typically take holes from the middle of leaves though. So if you're dealing with holes in the middle, middle of your leaves as well, I would probably take something down to your local garden center, have them ID maybe what's going on. You're probably dealing with a different type of insect issue, I'm guessing. Irio Lexus said, Laura, question about rose hips. If you pull the old petals off but don't actually cut off the old bloom, will you still get rose hips? Yep. If you really want the rose hips but don't like the look of the old pe petals sitting on the plant, I don't like the look of that either. Yep, you can go in and clean those off, no problem. Amber said, on a hybrid tea rose, would you still cut above a stem with five leaves if it means cutting off more than a foot of stem length? It feels like I would be cutting off too much and the remaining stem would be much shorter than the rest of the plant. Uh, I would definitely because you want to encourage the type of growth that will produce more blooms for you. And typically when you're going in, not all of them need to be cut back that short. Um, so it might be that you have to do that with a few of them and the rest of them you don't have to, but I would look for the set of five leaves. Leah said, I planted two Oso rose bushes this year. Do you need to prune or deadhead at the five leaf or more on those type of rose bush? Um, on those, it doesn't matter uh, because, and I think I mentioned on the oh so easies and some types of landscape roses, they do not need to be deadheaded in order to con encourage continue, continued blooming. So they're going to produce new blooms no matter what you do with the old spent blooms. You could leave them on the plant, you can cut them off, the plant will still produce new ones. Terry said, do you have to clean or sterilize the falcos between each plant or isn't it as important when you're trimming all of the same thing like all roses? Well, technically you would want to to clean your pruners between each plant because it could be a possibility that one of your roses has a disease, something viral that you don't know about. Um, maybe it's, maybe it has presented or maybe it hasn't yet. It's possible when you cut something else, another rose bush, you could spread it to that rose bush. So technically you would want to cut, um, you would want to clean them between each rose bush. I don't, um, which I probably should. I don't. I have too many. I mean, you could take out the, what's the spray? Like the Lysol? Is it Lysol? Like disinfectant spray? Mm -hmm. And you can just spray your, pruners down pretty easily. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, that wouldn't be too much uh, work, I suppose. Leslie said, I planted a quart size at last rose last season that's starting to bloom. It's still tiny, so I don't see any stem with five leaves. Once the cluster is done blooming, what do you recommend? I would just cut the branch off. Even if, if there's a no set of five leaves, just to clean it up, I would cut that off. And that way the plant will have more energy, even though it may not produce a bloom off that a specific stem, your plant will have much more energy to produce blooms on the rest of the rose plant because it's not trying to form hips on what you've left on the plant. Next video, last video, uh, was several landscape and container project updates. So we went down to the church where Erin and I go and we've done several projects over the years. Uh, we planted a hedge of arborvitas like the one we have here. We've done uh, flower bed projects, container projects, and then we most recently planted up the containers on the patio for summer. 
So I went through and just talked about all of them. I actually took plants down to replace some of the pansies in our spring pots, but the pansies still look so good that I didn't. I didn't replace them, um, but it was still fun to go through and talk about some of the changes in those areas. Uh, some of them are just like intensely different, like just have done really well. Mary said, love the remember when aspect of this. Reminds of, uh, reminds of all the progress that we typically overlook in our own lives. Thanks for that joy. I think I mentioned that in the video, like it's a good idea to go back and really look at where you started in mm -hmm. specific areas and look at where you're at. Because oftentimes we forget about all the things that we've done uh, because all we see is that list stretched out in front of us of the things we still need to do. Um, so it's good. It's a good reminder. I thought it was funny when we were planting up that front flower bed, I was still using a shovel. Yeah. Um, yeah, instead of using augers. And it just takes so much longer. I just looked at that thinking, oh, yeah. Oh, I remember when. Well, that ARB project was basically the first project that we started using the auger. I was and afraid to use the auger, remember? Yeah. You used it the whole yeah. time. I was like, oh, I don't know right. about this. And now it's just indispensable. Yeah. That's the right word? Yeah. Barb says, I wonder if someone tipped out their coffee or beverage on those lime sweet potato vine plants in the pot in the shade. I saw that comment a lot. Yeah. That is something to consider because the other two have a little bit of that burn, but they could be cleaned up and they'd be totally fine. But that one that's right by the chair mm -hmm. just looks so bad. Yeah, it's quite possible. It is possible. I'll mention that. See if maybe we could scoot that chair away from the yeah. pot or scoot the pot away from the chair. Sandy said, I just watched the 2020 ARB video yesterday. Those chunks of pavement were no joke. I rem remember those. Yeah. Yeah, underneath where we needed to plant some of those arbs. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. I remember it was the very end of the project too and we were tired. Yep. We were like, what is underneath this soil? <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> uh, it's nothing, yeah. Seems kind of like how it goes. Like right, right. at the end, something's thrown in. Like right. we'll break a pipe. Yeah. Right at the end of a project and oh, uh, yeah. I've been wondering for a while why you call your previous home a townhouse. It doesn't appear to be two-story all attached in a row. Is this house in town? Uh, it's a uh, townhouse. There's two of them connected. We owned both of them, uh, and we lived in one, and the other side my sister rented from us. Uh, we sold we sold my sister's side first, right? We sold them within a month of each other. Yeah. But they were, like, we call anything, any houses that are, con like, conjoined mm -hmm. to be a townhouse, even if it's not two-story. Mm -hmm. And they weren't small. I mean, they were close to 1,600 square feet. Were they really? Yeah, it was three-bedroom, two-bath. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, it was plenty of space for us. We lived there for like eight and a half years or something, eight yeah. years. We always felt like it was a little tight if you were entertaining, like if we had, you know, if you had family over, yeah. it was hard to get enough seating and all that, mm -hmm. but, um, but otherwise, great place. Yeah. Uh, Margaret said, is the overhang of that tree keeping those arbs from keeping up with the rest? Quite possibly. Yeah. I'm getting more shade. I've noticed that um, here on the other side of the willow. Yeah. Our arbs are smaller on that side too. And they're a little more spindly. Yeah. They're not as thick. They're just not healthy. getting the same amount of sun. No. They are, they're also getting some water from our sprinkler system right there. And so yeah. they've got our water spots yeah. on them build up. Uh, Diane said, hello, it's fun to, to look back. Can you explain when and how to cut back the denim and lace Russian sage? I planted one in my garden this year for the first time. Super easy, late in the season or early in the, like late in the fall season or early in the spring, you go in and just cut them back to about this far. That's it. Super easy to maintain. And they don't want to be fertilized, so all you have to do is cut them back. That is it. Just provide them a dry, hot spot, and they're just going to perform their heads off for you. Tiffany said, can you do a video or explain the different lavender varieties like bloom time, height, etc.? That's a really good idea. You know, I haven't grown, though, like a ton of varieties. I've grown a handful. Mm -hmm. So I'd be able to speak you know, like from experience on a few varieties. Um, but There's a lot of varieties, I know. There I really is. But, you know, I could talk to um, the gal at the Lavender Farm, mm -hmm. and my parents have grown other varieties. Um, that would be an interesting subject for sure. Yeah. And that is it for today's recap video. So now we're going to go out and pl plant Do some something. stuff. Do <laughs> something. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you have a great week, and we will see you in the next one.